I got a dad joke for you. Okay. How do you know if a river is rich if it needs two banks? <laughs> ah, yeah, so I did there. I, I've got a, a word story program, problem for you. If eggs cost 12 cents a dozen, how many eggs can you get for a dollar? If eggs cost 12 cents a dozen, how many eggs can you get for a dollar? Can you go, go ahead and shout it out. So 18, 111, 100. That is exactly right. Or is it you? Yes, 100 because they're at one cent per egg. Good job. Yes. It's one of those like it should be easy, but it's not. So uh, we'll move on from math to Matthew. Oh, wow. <laughs> Matthew 6. 19 to 24 is what we're looking at today. If you would turn there, that would be awesome. So you're ready to look at God's word for yourself. We are in a mini-series. We've, we've, we've returned to our, 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 our overall series of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' famous, most famous sermon, probably a collection of his teachings over several different days, uh, all brought together in one message from Jesus for his disciples and for the crowds. And so we're, we're, we've been, it's so long, we've been, we've been working on it for months, we've divided it into little mini-series. So the little mini-series we're on right now is called Mine, Not Mine. And this is exactly what Joseph was talking about just a few minutes ago, that uh, yes, I have my breath, this is my breath, these are my clothes, this is my house, this is my, these are my shoes. Well, yes. It's mine, but really everything belongs to God and everything came from him. It's mine, but it's also not mine. It all belongs to God. And we're looking at, in this little mini-series, what Jesus taught his disciples, his apprentices, really. And a, and a, and a disciple is not just someone who thinks about Jesus like, oh, he's nice. It's an, an apprentice. It's someone who takes time to be with Jesus, to, to learn from him, to sit at his feet, and to imitate him, to do what he did. That's, that's an apprentice. That is a disciple. And we're becoming more and more like Jesus. So we want to know what he says about money and about generosity. We want to get his mindset about it. How, we want to have a kingdom mindset. And throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is trying to give us a kingdom mindset about life. About We talked about relationships and different things, uh, uh, and now we're talking about money. What is the kingdom mindset? And our mindset is, and needs to be, according to Jesus, that everything belongs to God. It's his. So when, when we give to God, like in an offering, like we just did a few moments ago in the service, it's not like, well, Lord, okay, I'm going to give you some of my stuff. It's more like, God, you've given me everything. I'm going to give you back some of what you already gave me. It's just a different mindset. It's an upside-down mindset. And then it's really a privilege to give to God. Yeah. You know, knowing that, like, if you're sitting there and your dad bought you a meal and you're sitting there eating it and dad says, can I have one of your fries? I'm like, sure, you gave them to me in the first place. Yeah. You know, it, it's like that. It feels like that with God. And it's really a, just a very wonderful, loving thing to have that mindset. Started with God's love. Last Sunday, we began this little mini-series, Mine Not Mine. And Pastor Christian brought a great message, talked about the motive for giving. And I love the way he contrasted greedy giver and gracious giver. So the motive for giving is to extend the grace that God's given to you to others. He's given you grace. He's given you gifts. You extend it to others. That's, that's the motive for giving. Not, not, we, don't, we don't give uh, to gain applause. So we ought to make sure that when we do things that are often done in public, like giving, praying, fasting, those things are often done in, in public. We just had a generosity time. It's a public thing. We're here. But our motive needs to not be to get the applause of the people around us. Our motive is a focus on God, and it's a, it's a gratefulness to, to him. It is a pressing into his presence. It's an imitating of Jesus. That's our motive. That's, that's what our heart is to be, keeping our focus on God. Amen? Amen? Amen, really. That's what we're about. So in today's message, this is a really interesting one, and I have seen it in a way like I've never seen before. And so I'm, I'm hoping to be able to communicate that to you Jesus uses three separate images to communicate one single idea. And that's why they're grouped together. But on, on the surface, 
you might think one of these things is not like the other, the middle one. But really, they're all communicating the same single idea. So let's see if we can figure out what that idea is. So today's title and those three images are Your Treasure, Your Eye, and Your Master. Your Treasure, Your Eye, and Your Master. Pretty interesting. So why don't you jump in with me to Matthew chapter 6, and we'll start with just the first little, we're going to take it a couple verses at a time, one, one image at a time. So starting in, in verse 19, Jesus is speaking to the crowds, to his disciples surrounded by people who were interested. And he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them. So picture moth eating a wool garment. Where moths eat them and rust destroys them. The, the original, the root words there is it's, it's like something is eating and, and devouring something that you have and decaying it. Uh, so the translators translated that to rust. Where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. So, in other words, lift your eyes a little bit. Think beyond this moment when you think about your finances. And then he wraps it up in verse 21 and says, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will also be. So earthly things are temporary, and Jesus talks about that. Hey, these things, you, you got to have a house, you got to have uh, clothes, you got to have food, you got to have those different things, but all these things are temporary. They, they decay, they, they do not last forever. They can get stolen from you. And Jesus points us to something heavenly that lasts. And the first thing I think of when I think of something that lasts forever is love. Love lasts forever. It, love for God, love for people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, it says, These three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So Jesus is saying, man, if you could store up love, that would be a much more lasting, permanent thing than all those things you shop for online. Jesus may not have said the online part, but it's implied. It's right in between those verses there. So I, I do want to just clarify this. Building wealth is not bad. Building wealth is good. In fact, throughout the Bible, uh, uh, many times God talks about wealth as a reward. So wealth is from God, and the ability to gain wealth is from God. So that is very good. Th those are good things. In fact, let's just get practical. Jesus' ministry was supported by the affluence. So he didn't have to go to work at Walmart. He was able to just go and focus on the ministry, and he had a lot to do in a short time, and he could do that. He was free to do that, and the disciples, the, the, the 12 especially coming with him, they were free to do that because of the faithfulness of affluent people. There were leading women and leading uh, other people that supported financially the ministry. So we got to make sure that we understand in context, Jesus is not saying building wealth is bad. So he's talking about something else. Uh, uh, there are two rich, men, or two rich men who showed up and were talked about, written about in Jesus' biographies, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's really interesting when you contrast these two rich people. The first one is often nicknamed the rich young ruler. And he was a guy who, he was a very devout follower of God. And he had been obeying all of God's uh, commandments, all, all of those things that it said to do in the law. He had been very, very faithful. And I believe that it was out of a heart of devotion for God that he was doing it. It didn't seem like he was a legalistic guy. And Jesus has this little conversation with him. They talk a little bit, and Jesus kind of probes and stuff. And the guy is saying to him, what else do I have to do to inherit an eternal life? And Jesus goes, oh, I, I see. I, I know what it is. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Come and follow me, and you will have eternal life. Jesus did not say this in the Sermon on the Mount. 
He didn't say this to everyone. He said it to one guy because Jesus looked into his heart and he said, okay, you want life, and I believe you do. For you, there's something that's holding you back. Get, ready, get rid of your wealth. He didn't say that to anybody else. But to that guy, because of where his focus was, Jesus says, you got to get rid of all that and start over and just get your heart focused on me, and then we'll go from there. And you know what that guy did? He turned away. He said, I'll take the wealth, thank you. Because he had a lot of it, the Bible says. That is not a kingdom mindset about finances. There's a second guy that's called a rich man, and his name was Joseph. He's from the little town of Arimathea. And he was rich and a disciple of Jesus, both. The first guy was rich, not yet a disciple. <laughs> this guy was rich and a disciple, and you know what he did? He gave up his own tomb. Okay, so a tomb was not like you just go down to Washelles and buy a plot. That was not what it was. It was carve it out of a mountainside of a rock with primitive tools. This was a very valuable piece of property. And Joseph gave up his own tomb so that Jesus could be buried in it. Like that, that is an amazing sacrifice, and we still talk about it today. Wealth is not bad. But when it, wealth becomes the focus of your life, instead of loving and serving Jesus and others, wealth becomes bad. Yeah. It becomes bad. Yeah. It wasn't bad, but you just made it bad. Because you made it something it's not supposed to be. When you make wealth your God, that's bad. That's bad. 1 Timothy 6.10 is the most often misquoted verse in the Bible. And I bet if I gave you a prompt, you would... Many of you would quote it the wrong way. Let's, get, let's add all the words in there that were in the Bible. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money, the love of money. That's a big and very important distinction. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In other words, the love of money is a gateway sin. It's a gateway sin. And we're talking about beyond financial sins. But when you love money, it begins to creep out and seep out in other areas of your life because your focus is off. And then you let your guards down and you get into all kinds of sin when you love money. So Jesus said, don't store up. And he said, do store up. Okay, so on the don't store up, don't store up treasures here on earth, he does not mean, and I, I'm, I'm thankful to John Wesley uh, for this little list. He does not mean you can't work to provide your family. That's not what he's saying. When Jesus says don't store up treasures on earth, he's not saying don't work to provide for your family. Yeah. Of course, yeah. you, got, you got to work. It doesn't mean you shouldn't pay your bills and taxes. That's not what Jesus was saying. He said, give to Caesar what Caesar's. Give to the government what, what belongs to them and give to God what, what belongs to God. Um, so when Jesus said, don't store up treasures in heaven, he doesn't mean that you should not save up for emergencies. Read the book of Proverbs. Like, it, it is a biblical thing to save up for emergencies. And it does not mean you should not save up to accomplish what God has called you to do. So if God has called you to do a certain thing, and that takes some savings, save up. Uh, how many people have gone on a missions trip and they had to work, yeah. take an extra job, do a, do a garage sales, do everything like to get there and go and God meets them and does amazing things. Like that's good to store up treasures to go on a mission trip or to, go, to do whatever God's called you to do. The thing that we're focusing on here is where is your focus? Where is your love? Where is your love? Craig Keener said that if you really trust God, you will live as if treasures in heaven really matter. If you really trust God, you will live as if treasures in heaven really matter. So we've got to ask ourselves, do you and I, do we really love God? Do I really love God? Do you really love God? Because if you do, you will live as if treasures in heaven matter. And that will affect your home budget. That will affect your finances, your, your financial choices. It will affect a lot of things if you really believe that treasures in heaven matter. Uh, 80 years or uh, 90 years here on this earth, it seems like such a long time to us, but compare that to eternity, and it is just a grain of sand versus a mountain. Like, it, it, treasures in heaven really matter. And Jesus says you can store them up. 
You can store up treasures in heaven. So what do we got to do? Live simply in light of eternity to make room for God's kingdom purposes in your life. So it is okay to sometimes say no to something that you need or want in order to be able to defer to God's purposes. God, what do you want done with, with these finances? What do you want done with these resources of my time, talent, and treasure? What do you want? What is your purpose for them? Why did you give me this breath? What did you want from me? What, what did you want to do, accomplish great things through me? Let, that's, that's a kingdom mindset. So, and so, sometimes means you need to live a little bit more simply. You need to simplify somewhere to make some room. We, we've all done it when you feel stressed or overwhelmed or whatever. What do you do? You simplify. You say, well, okay, well, I guess I just can't do everything I plan to do this week. I've got to make some choices or I'm not going to get the rest that I need. And it's the same thing with finances. Okay, so the first thing is your treasure. That's the first image. The second image down at uh, Matthew 6, 22, is your eye. Your eye. Your eye. Now, by the way, in Jesus' day, there were actually a couple different theories of, of what the eye does. And the one that Jesus is alluding to right here is that people perceived that your eye is a window that lets light out from the inside of you to others. In other words, your eye is where what's inside of you comes out and affects others. That was, that was just sort of a, a, a way that people thought about eyes in that day. And Jesus says, your eye, that window that you're used to thinking about, is like a lamp. What does a lamp do? A lamp lets light out and it shines on people and objects. Okay, so both of these, uh, these ideas, there, it's this, there's something outward coming. So Jesus says your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When, uh, when your eye is healthy, uh, some would say, some translators, when your eye is honest and clear. Uh, another one is when your eye is generous, your whole body is filled with light, which means more can spill out. Good things can spill out of your eyes onto others. But when your eye is unhealthy, and this root word means evil, begrudging, or stingy. Wow. You can he see how begrudging and st stingy are, are sort of related there. When your eye is unhealthy, Jesus said, your whole body is filled with darkness. In other words, your eye is shining out darkness because there's darkness inside you. So if your eye is evil, it's because your insides are evil, begrudging, or stingy. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. When I read this uh, uh, first in, in pre preparing for this message, I just went, okay, wait. Jesus is, he is talking about something I don't understand, how this even correlates with finances, because there's finances before it and after it, and like quite a bit after it. It's, it is in the middle of a long discourse about the kingdom mindset about money and finances. How does this even relate? And, and for Jesus to say, if the light you think you have is actually darkness, in other words, if you are deceived, how deep that darkness is. I talked about this a little teeny bit at, at prayer gathering last Wednesday night, our deliverance night, which was great, by the way, great time of ministry. If the light you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Deception is when you think that you're living for Jesus, but you're actually focused on something else. And in this case, on accumulating things, you are deceived. And if you're deceived, you do not know you're deceived. <laughs> that is the very definition. It's when you're believing something that is not true about yourself. Uh, another translation says about that last little phrase of Jesus is, darkness doesn't come any darker than that. Darkness doesn't come any darker than that. Wow. In Matthew 20, verse 15, Jesus told a story. It's a story that he, that he uh, just made up to, to share a lesson. It was a story about a farmer who hired a crew of people. 
And so back in that day, uh, he just needed people to work the farm. So goes down, to the, the farmer goes down to the village square, finds some people standing around early in the morning, takes them home, says, I will pay you this amount for the day. And then he, 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 goes, he needs some more people, goes back at noon. Hey, can you guys come work? I'm going to give you a certain amount for the day. And then he goes some more at 3, some more at 5 p.m., and then quitting time, 6 p.m. And, and he calls them all, all in together, and he, he starts to give out people their wages, but he, he does something a little surprising. He gives every one of those workers the same salary. He, he did not go hourly. He went salary. And whether they worked 12 hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or whether they worked one hour, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., he gave them, he chose to give them all the same salary. Well, you can imagine those who were hired early in the day, worked longer, worked to the hottest part of the day, they got mad and they got jealous when the later hired got the same pay as they did. And listen to what the farmer in Jesus' story says to those mad and jealous people. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous, circle that word, should you be jealous because I am kind to others? That word jealous, I I stumbled on this because I, I did a search for that root word. It's the same root word as a begrudging eye. When this, the, if you went literally word for word in the original language this is written in, it, it doesn't show up in, in the English language I just, I just read. Should you be jealous? It's the word I. Should you have a begrudging I because I am kind to others? So that's, that was one of those reasons why we say when Jesus is talking about begrudging or stinginess, And so Jesus is saying, when you have a healthy eye, you have a generous eye. And what's spilling out for you from you is, man, God's given me everything. I want you to have everything. I want you to have everything. I want you to have everything. Jesus says, but if you have an unhealthy eye, you're like, I want to get all I can. And I want to make sure you don't get anything about belongs to me. In fact, I want to beat you. I want to have more than you. That is begrudging others of God's blessing in their lives. And Jesus says, that is not cool. And if that's the light you got in you, that's not light. That is darkness. And if you don't even know it's there, if you're thinking you're living in light, you are in deep darkness. This really hit me. This was like, wow, I have never seen that before. Uh, Really interesting when you look a little bit deeper. So this jealous word, it is uh, this begrudging, it is a covetous, envious heart. It it was thought of of as a glance that shoots daggers. So in other words, I'm looking at you going, oh, (laughs) daggers. I want more than you got. And Jesus saying, that's not a kingdom mindset. Put your daggers away, people. Put them away. In Jesus' story, it's the, it's the kind of worker who wants to get more than others. Jesus, in Jesus, in the kingdom mindset, they would have gone, oh, isn't that cool? The guy who only worked an hour, he didn't have a chance to work as much as me, but God blessed him as much. Man, that is awesome. I celebrate with you, one-hour worker. Yeah. Woo, high five. That's awesome. We can all go out and have pizza. That is awesome. But do you see what an upside-down mentality that is about money? That is a kingdom mindset about money. So having a healthy eye in the Sermon on the Mount is responding with compassion when you see others in need. Having an evil eye is wanting to make sure you get more than the others around you. So if your perspective is distorted by materialism, You're blinded to God's truth. You can't even see it. If your perspective is distorted by Glamour magazine, by Esquire magazine, by Fortune 500 magazine, by Money magazine, if your your perception is distorted by materialism, you are blinded. You can't even see God's truth. 
God's truth is it's a blessing when anybody gets anything. That is God's truth. And we just rejoice when anyone gets anything. So what do we got to do? Don't focus on the accumulation of things. Focus on doing God's will. Some of you are very good with money. And so that is a gift that God gave you. Man, I, I pray that you are blessed beyond measure and that the kingdom of God grows because of you, because you are able to put in more than a lot of us are. That's awesome. And, and that is the kind of people we have at NFC. I, I can tell you that right now. Uh, whether, whether you're giving a little or giving a lot, whether I'm giving a little, giving a lot, we're all in this together, and we are focused on God. <laughs> we just want to please him. We want to have his mindset about money, about everything in life. And then there's one last image. Matthew, it, it's, it's your master. In Matthew 6, 24, Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and you will love the other. Now, we read this and we automatically want to soften it. Jesus probably didn't say will. He probably said might. Maybe, perhaps. He might have. No, he said, you cannot serve two masters, for you will hate one, and you will love the other. You will be devoted to one, and you will despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So now, you got to hear what he's saying. He did not say, you cannot serve God and have a dollar. That is not what he said. You cannot have two masters. Money cannot be your master. And it's really interesting here that Jesus personifies money. You know what personify means? You, you, t- you take an object and give it human-like qualities. You give it living qualities. And Jesus is saying money is like that. Money is a master. And it reminds us of the first of the Ten Commandments. The very, very first one. Exodus 20, verse 3. You must not... Have any other God, small g, but me. Like that is, that's the first thing God thought of when he wanted to help his people learn how to follow him. The the first thing, you must not have any other gods but me. So when Jesus personifies money, the the original is mammon. It is a little bit, just a little bit more nuanced than just a pile of money. It is the spirit of, of focusing on accumulating and hoarding things. It is a greedy spirit. That is mammon. So Jesus says, you cannot be enslaved to that and have God as your master. You, you can't, those are mutually exclusive. They, can, they cannot both be true at the same time. Two masters, one is God, one is mammon, or the love of things. And money wants to be your God. It wants to. It's always trying to usurp God's place in your life. If Jesus' vision of the kingdom of God doesn't reshape your approach to possessions, then you're not living out Jesus' vision. It is not impacting you. It's not affecting you. No one can serve two masters. You either love, serve, and trust God or money. And I love Craig Keener said, and if you think you can love both masters, you have become an idolater. An idolater is someone who worships something other than God. The most important offering you can make to God is yourself. So trust God. Trust him. Trust him with your finances. Trust him with your life. Trust him with everything. And know that he's a good, good father, and he's not trying to take from you. It's more like he just bought you dinner and says, can I have a fry just for the joy of having a fry with you? It's more like that. That's how God is. So how do you follow Jesus generally, and how do you embrace what he's teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, Jesus chose a life of poverty and simplicity. He said about himself, I I don't even have a home. I don't even have a place to lay in my head. He just borrowed. He, he couch surfed. That's what Jesus did. He chose that life. Other contributors provided his food and clothing. So does that mean you're not supposed to have a house? 
You're not supposed to have a place to lay your head. Like, if Jesus wore sandals, are you supposed to wear sandals? Like, uh, where, where, you know, where do you draw the line? Do you, are you supposed to sell all that you have and live on the street? No. Unless God speaks to you like that. We are called to live out Jesus' teachings in a very different context than him. You're not supposed to wear a robe because he wore a robe. We're in a different context. We don't wear robes here. Does that make sense? But we are supposed to obey Jesus in our context. So what does that look like here? we got to figure out how to follow Jesus in our context. And Jesus is calling you to live out his kingdom vision in our world. His vision for what life in the kingdom is like right here in our context. And we have a very good biblical example of this, the Apostle Paul, one of the early church leaders. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23, is this whole passage where he says, I'm willing to live like a slave if I'm in a context with slaves. I'm willing to live like a Jew if I'm in a context of, of Jews. I'm willing to live like a Gentile if I'm in a context with Gentiles in order to lead people to Jesus. So he wasn't sloppy living. He was focused on the kingdom of God. And he says, I got to do that in my context. And if I'm in a context with Jews, I'm going to live in such a way to bring Jews to Jesus. Live out kingdom vision, kingdom principles in our context, in your context. That's what we're called to do. You can simplify. You can. In this context, you can simplify your life in order to make room, time, talent, and treasure for God and for kingdom visions. You, you can simplify. You can make room to do what God wants to do through you. And you can trust God in this context, in this year, in this place. God's kingdom principles work anywhere. But they are lived out differently in each context. I, and I have been all over the world. Uh, I, I still have some places on my bucket list, but I have been to some very diverse places and seen people live according to kingdom principles in their context. And it's beautiful. It is amazing. I've been in some very poverty-stricken situations. And I've seen them living for God, living unselfishly. They don't have piles of money to give, but they got a chicken, and they will give it to you. They will give you their last chicken. Wow. That is a kingdom mindset. And it's really cool that it works in any context we're in. Would you stand to your feet? And let's pray. If you're online, would you, would you just make where you are a place of prayer and just stop, just stop everything, just for a moment. And let's just respond in our hearts and our minds and our mouths to this word. It's Jesus teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would expand our minds to your thinking to your vision, to the kingdom of God. You taught us to pray, come kingdom of God, be done will of God right now. You taught us to pray that. So Lord, stretch our minds so we get what it is. And Lord Jesus, I pray that I do not have any darkness in me that I'm calling light. And Lord, I pray that for all of us, Lord God, that we would not have any darkness in us that we are calling light. That, In other words, Lord, I don't want to be saying and even preaching, I'm following you and not and not be. <laughs> Lord, help me. I don't want to be like that. Help us and not be like that, Lord God. So reveal those places that are where we're still living in darkness, where we are, we are living out principles that are not of the kingdom. There's something we read on a magazine or see on TV or a movie. Lord God, show us, reveal us, stop us in our tracks, Lord God, and help us to make room for what you want to do through us. Help us to make room, Lord God. With your head still bowed, I just want to ask you, do you live as if treasures in heaven really matter? Do you live that way? And it's good to be reminded, maybe you've been kind of forgetting about that for a while. It's okay, that's why you came to, to be a part of this, this service today. That's, that's great. But do you, I mean, let's, that's the measure. Do you live your life as if treasures in heaven really matter? Or do you sort of ignore that? Is your perspective distorted by materialism? Don't say no too quickly. Instead, say, Holy Spirit, show me. Just in case I might not see it, please show me. Are you trying to love God, but you're really focused on money or things? 
I mean, we got, this is real, man. We gotta, we gotta look at our lives. It's important. So would you raise your hands if you need to simplify and you're just saying, God, would you help me simplify? My hand's right up. Yes. Time, talent, and treasure. I need to simplify so that God can do more stuff through me. And lots of hands go up. That's very encouraging. You can put them down. Uh, do you, raise your hands if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You need to embrace God's truth. You need to embrace God's truth. Maybe you, you're realizing, man, there, there might be some stinking thinking in there. I need to embrace God's truth. Good. Several hands went up on that also. Raise your hands if you need to trust God first. You need to trust God first. Yes. It's scary to trust God because we can't see him. But if you pay attention, you can see what he's doing in your life. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray for all of us who need to simplify, Lord. It's just so easy to let a bunch of stuff crowd you out and your workout in our, uh, of our lives, Lord. So I pray you'd show us what to simplify. Lord, give us a hint of what, what you want to do through us. Give us a promise or a song or speak to us in prayer, Lord God, or a vision. Lord God, I pray that you would show us what do you have in mind for us. Maybe we're settling for so much less than you want to do. Maybe you want one of us to build a church building. Maybe you want one of us to go to another place that's never heard about Jesus and share. Maybe you have something so much more in mind that we've been settling for so much less. Lord, speak to us and help us to simplify. Do what we gotta do so that we can get to where you're taking us, Lord God. Lord, show us. Lord, I pray you'd help us to embrace your truth. Lord God, I pray that you would reveal, convict, show us, help us read a, ver a, a Bible verse that just makes us go, ah, wow, I see it now. I have been thinking about that upside down. Lord God, I pray, show us and help us to embrace your truth. And Lord, help us to trust you, even when it's so hard, Lord God, e even, even when we just can't see where that answer is coming from. Lord, I pray you'd help us to trust you and to obey you. And Lord, I'm specifically asking you, Lord God, to help me and help us to obey you in something small this week, to start there, in something small. Help us to obey you in something small so that we can hear more clearly the big things you want to do through us. With your head still bowed, I just want to give you one more invitation, and that's to put your faith in Jesus. I don't know if you ever put your faith in him or if you have walked away from him at some point, but I, I, I want to encourage you to become part of the kingdom of God. There's only two kingdoms, kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light. Because of sin, we're all born into the kingdom of darkness. So how do you go to the kingdom of light? Turn from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead you. That's where it starts. And then begin to be Jesus' apprentice. Do you want to do that today? If you're in the room, would you just raise your hand? And that would say, I want to do that. I want to put my faith in Jesus. Thank you. And then online, same thing. And I see hands going up, and that's so good. This is a great moment of transformation in your life. I want to just coach you in a prayer. Would you repeat after me? But don't talk to me. Pray it to Jesus. And church, let's help him out. Let's do it. Jesus, Jesus. I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sins and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we just welcome you to the family of God, to the kingdom of God. you put your faith in Jesus. It's so good. And if you just raised your hand or if you just, if you just gave your life to Jesus just now online or in the room, would you just take out your cell phone right now so you don't forget it, right now, and text the word RESTART. Text the word RESTART to that same phone number, 97000, and give me enough contact info that I can get you back an email because I, I, wanna, I, I don't want to leave you stranded. Don't leave me hanging. No, because I, I was leaving you hanging. Don't leave me hanging. Give me enough contact info. So that I can give you, I can give you some next steps. All right, God bless you. Hey, that was awesome. That was so good. Um, so many good lessons. I, I was sitting there trying to think of one, and but I just really like the fry analogy. That was really good. It just really shows, you know, how our perspective on things can get so twisted, so distorted. But that's not what it's about. You know, God's a He's a good dad. He's a good father. So. Amen to that, yeah? <laughs> um, anyway, so if it's your first time, your second time, 
text Greek don't, to 97,000. Yeah, don't forget, because we want to we wanna get in contact with you. And then, if you're online, we love you. Thanks for being here. You guys are awesome. Uh, make sure you subscribe, like, share, all the good stuff. And we'll see you guys next week, yeah. online and in person. Yeah.